Hello and welcome to this presentation about the PF interval. My name is Sandy Dunn, I'm the Managing Director of Assertivity and it's my pleasure to give you this introduction to what is one of the key concepts that underpins reliability centred maintenance and condition based maintenance. So what is the PF interval? Well, as I said, it is a key concept of reliability centred maintenance. Uh, it also is core to determining what frequency you should perform a condition-based maintenance inspection at. And it's also a term that was first coined by the late John Mowbray, the uh, developer and author of the RCM2 approach to reliability centred maintenance, and a man who I'm very fortunate to have been trained by in the United Kingdom in the early 1990s. We say it's, it's core to determining the frequency of a condition-based maintenance inspection. So what is a condition-based maintenance inspection? Well, it's really an inspection or test to determine whether an item is about to fail or is in the process of failing. Um, and so a key requirement for us to be able to do a condition-based maintenance inspection clearly is that the item must give us some warning uh, that it is about to fail. And fortunately for us, that's very often the case. In fact, most items give us some warning at least that they are about to fail. And some items actually give us multiple warnings that they're about to fail. So for example, if we looked at a rolling element bearing, the, the warning signals that we might get from that bearing um, to, that tells us that it's about to fail could include you know, high levels of vibration. Um, noise that is higher than we would normally expect to get from that bearing, uh, abnormally high temperatures, uh, an increased current draw on the motor if the bearing is attached to an electric motor or is being driven by an electric motor, or we might see abnormal uh, ultra ultrasonic sound emissions or potentially even uh, smoke um, and, and a whole range of potentially other warning conditions that this um, bearing is, is about to fail. And so what we can do is we can plot those warnings on, on a curve. So if we take that bearing and we consider, you know, from when it's running as new until it, it actually fails and suffers a functional failure, we might find that, for example, vibration gives us a certain amount of warning before the bearing fails. That uh, noise gives us uh, less warning that it's about to fail. That uh, heat maybe gives us less again and smoke gives us less again, potentially smoke doesn't give us very much warning at all from when we see smoke coming out of the bearing until the bearing actually suffers its functional failure, in this case that the bearing seizes. Um, and it's important to realise that the bearing actually only fails when it seizes. It only suffers a functional failure when it seizes. There's a temptation on some people's part to say, oh, the bearing, we've got high vibration on the bearing, it's failed. Well, actually, no, it hasn't. The bearing is still rotating, the, the driver is still driving the driven uh, item, it's that, that item is still uh, fulfilling its function in almost all cases, and therefore you know, the fact that we have high vibration does not mean that the bearing has failed. What it does mean is that it's about to fail if we don't do anything to avoid that failure. It doesn't actually suffer the functional failure until the bearing has seized. And so a potential failure condition, and that's a term again that's frequently used in reliability centred maintenance, is a clearly identifiable condition that indicates that that functional failure is about to occur, that the bearing in this case is about to seize or is in the process of occurring. And when we say clearly identifiable, what we mean is not just some vague woolly term like, oh, we've got high vibration or it's running hot, but what is the temperature at which we would say, would set an alarm level that says this bearing is about to fail, if we're using heat, for example, as, as our uh, potential failure condition. So we need to be able to clearly identify and specify as accurately as we can what that potential failure condition is. And so, you know, in general, what we'd find is that the point P on this curve is the point at which we can first detect that that item, in this case the bearing, is about to fail using that particular technique, for example heat, and using the alarm level that we've set for that failure technique, for example 65 degrees Celsius, if that was the, the alarm temperature. So the point at which we could first detect that that bearing was running at 65 degrees Celsius or higher would be our point P on this curve. And the point F 
then is the point at which we suffer a functional failure. In, again, in this case, the, with, in, with reference to the bearing, that the bearing has seized. And the time interval between those is what we call the PF interval. The, the time interval from when we can first detect the potential failure condition that the item is about to fail using the particular technique and alarm level we've set to the point at which we suffer that functional failure. And so our condition-based inspection, if we're using that technique, for example, heat, um, and measuring the temperature of this bearing, must be done at some frequency that is less than the shortest likely PF interval for that particular technique. Okay. Uh, and it's important that we do. For example, we set the, uh, the frequency of inspection or the interval between inspections at greater than this PF interval. Let's say that we said it was going to be twice the PF interval. Then we might come along at this point and say, oh, temperature's OK, the bearing's OK, I can leave it in service, it's, it's not about to fail. I come back later, uh, to, you know, at twice the PF interval, I come back here and I say, yep, it's, it's hotter than it was before, but it's still below my alarm level, so therefore I think the bearing's OK, it's not about to fail. Uh, when I come back next, whoops, I've gone past the point at which we've suffered the functional failure, and so therefore I've missed potentially uh, predicting that, uh, that upcoming failure. So I must do the inspection at a frequency that's less than the PF interval. Um, but it's not enough to be just less than the PF interval. It needs to be sufficiently less than the PF interval to allow me to avoid the consequences of the failure. Because if I did it, for example, at exactly the PF interval, then I might come along and do my inspection here just before the point P and I'd say, oh, it's OK, you know, it's very close to my alarm level, but it's still OK. Then I would come back at, at this point here just before the bearing's about to seize and that wouldn't necessarily give me enough time to be able to avoid the consequences of the failure. So what I need to be able to do is do my inspection sufficiently at an interval that's sufficiently less than the PF interval to be able to avoid the consequences of, the, of the, that failure. Um, so, um, so I guess a way of visualising that here is that let's say that it, it takes me, I have a certain amount of response time, shown here as the, as the red line on, on this graph, that you know, from when I can first detect this, this failure, it's going to take me that long to get organised to avoid the consequences of the failure, to you know, take the piece of equipment out of service for argument's sake or, or have a plan shut down and, and, and do that work on that plan shut down without uh, impacting on, on production, for example, if we were a productive plant. Um, and so what my task frequency must be, or my task interval must be, more specifically, is it must be, um, uh, I guess, the PF interval minus that response time. So in other words, I need to do, in this case, my uh, task needs to be done at an interval that's quite a lot less than the PF interval. Now, I know there's rules of thumb around that basically say, you know, you should do this task at half the PF interval as a rule of thumb. That may or may not be appropriate, um, but I, I think it's better to consider when I first detect this failure, how long is it going to take me to be able to respond in a planned manner to avoid the consequences of the failure? And, and I need to make sure that I do my inspection at, you know, at, at a time that is give me sufficient time to, to make that response. And that may be half the P of interval, it may be less than the half the P of interval, it may be, um, you know, it may be significantly more than half the P of interval. If the response time is more than the P of interval in, in, indeed, then you've got a problem. You don't, that, that particular technique clearly is not going to work for you. You'll need to find another technique or find another way of predicting or preventing the failure. Um, so, to sum up here, condition-based inspections are appropriate when we do get some warning that the item is about to fail, that we can specify that warning signal, you know, reasonably uh, accurately and specifically. So, for example, you know, temperature must be greater than 65 degrees C. That the PF interval is reasonably consistent um, for that alarm condition. So, you know, and when I say reasonably consistent, you might say, oh, look, we're, you know, somewhere within, you know, a week to 10 days. That might be all, that's, all the accuracy that's required, if, you know, for a for effective practical action. On the other hand, if you say, well, sometimes it's a day and sometimes it's a month, and, and I really can't understand you know, why it varies so widely, you might say, well, actually, this is not going to be a very reliable uh, condition um, monitoring technique. We might need to find another technique uh, that's, that's more, more stable and more predictable. 
Uh, and finally, it needs to be practical to be able to perform the inspection at a frequency that is less than the PF interval and or, you know, at the task interval. So in other words, at the, the PF interval minus the response time. So, you know, if you come up with uh, saying, well, we've got to do vibration analysis on this bearing, you know, every hour, uh, then you might say, well, you know, unless we've got permanently installed monitoring, that's really not going to be a practical outcome. So therefore, we'll have to find uh, another type of task uh, for, for dealing with that uh, particular failure mode. So that's an introduction to the PF interval and, and some of the key concepts uh, uh, that, uh, that it applies to. Um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about this, we do talk about this in, in a bit more detail in our reliability centred maintenance and uh, PM optimization training courses that we run as public courses around Australia from time to time. Uh, there's a link on the screen there for uh, to, to those courses so if you're interested you can have a look at our uh, course schedule and and consider coming along to one of those or we can run those courses in-house uh, for you for your organization if that's a, a, a better option for you and we can also provide consulting assistance as well in this space you know if you're looking to improve your preventive maintenance program uh, through the use of reliability center maintenance or pm optimization techniques that's something that we've uh, have a lot of experience with and uh, we'd be delighted to have the opportunity to help you as well. So that's it. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And um, you know, I hope that we might see you on one of our courses or that we might hear from you if we can help you. But uh, if not, enjoy. <laughs>